Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 26. This video will be about energy destruction as well as answering questions to uh, people who made comments with regard to video number two which is uh, Maxwell's displacement current caper. Uh, in these two topics we're going to introduce two more rules of acquisition. This video is going to be electrical engineering intensive uh, but there are sections that are not for people that are not EE savvy. Uh, essentially this video was going to be number 26 about the planets but most of that material got moved into video number 25 so I'm using this video to, do, to address viewer questions. One question was about energy creation and energy destruction. I'm going to show you that energy most certainly is created and therefore is most certainly destroyed. Uh, we're also going to discuss topics related to questions on video number two with regard to the uh, displacement current in good conductors. Uh, the overarching theme of this video is to be aware of the idealizations and simplifications bantered about in academia. Uh, colleges make money by maintaining maximum enrollment, thus complex theories and models are idealized and simplified to maintain the maximum number of people to pass the given test to move on to the next level because no, and uh, you know, if you don't graduate they can't bug you for donations and essentially because of this idealization simplification nobody graduates as an expert in their field even if they got complete straight A's okay until you actually get out there and use the stuff you'll find you have to do a lot more that what they taught you is just a glazing over uh, the depths of what's really going on um, and also and if you look in video number 13 I demonstrate a paradox which results from these idealizations and simplifications so what's the myth what they tell you in college is energy is neither created nor destroyed, it just changes form. But you could make a simple argument that, oh, if this were true, then the universe was then never created. Because the energy, the energy had to get here somewhere. So, so we can say that you know, something had to put all the energy in the universe to begin with, or perhaps the universe began by some event that concentrated the existing energy, like pushing two charges together. But if the universe were separated charges and we had to push the two charges together then that would require us to add additional energy into the universe and essentially we don't know enough about anything to say with certainly that energy can't be created or destroyed so in the next few slides I'll show you that energy is most certainly being destroyed and it's a tremendous amount of energy uh, if you consider the coulomb or electric field of an elementary charge in video 14 I demonstrated that a field is an emission of energy, even the static field of a Coulomb charge or the static field of a magnet. In 21 demonstrated that the emission of a field requires a consumption of some form of fuel, otherwise mass would be lost. So thus how it works is that the charge consumes the ether like a fuel and emits a Coulomb field. So a negative charge takes in ether and emits a negative Coulomb field a positive charge takes in ether and emits a positive Coulomb field. And we'll talk about the exact mechanism of how that translation occurs when we get to the electromagnetic section. Okay, but the problem is at a very, very significant distance from these two charges, assume these are the two charges that make up a hydrogen atom, you know, a proton and an electron, and at a significant distance from the, the pair, the field, the Coulomb field is zero. So it's either that the fields, when they get to this point, they completely cancel and there's nothing there, or the two fields are there, but they, because they're equal and opposite, we can't measure them. There's no way we can measure these fields if they're still there. So even if the energy is still there, it is not measurable by, by any known means. And if we can't measure it, we can't use it. And therefore, the energy is forever lost to us. Consequently, the energy is destroyed for all intents and purposes. And we'll cover this in much more detail when we get to the section on energy. We're going to cover energy in more detail when we get to the EM section. All right, so let's get uh, switch over to the, well, I guess that ended the discussion about energy, and we'll talk about energy later when we get to the electromagnetic section. Okay, so now let's switch over to the displacement current caper. Okay, in video number two, I argue that displacement current cannot be generated by a magnetic field. Oh, I'm sorry, the displacement current cannot generate a magnetic field, otherwise we would have overunity from a current in a closed loop. And viewers have argued that there is no displacement current in a good conductor using the following two arguments. The first argument is we're told in school that there is no electric field inside a good conductor, that the electric field 
is only is perpendicular to the surface and therefore there can't be a displacement current in the direction of current flow. Uh, but Ohm's law contradicts that. And I'm not going to go over Ohm's law. You can do that on your own. But I'll show you a, 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 that this is what well, this is a simplification, which leads to a bigger paradox than the displacement current caper. If we put charges in a good conductor, or the blue is like a good conductor, and, we, and, we, and normally the, a good conductor has got equal number of positive and negative charges, but let's add extra charge to the conductor. And so what's going to happen is the Coulomb forces among these charges are going to force them to spread out evenly such that at any point in space on the outside of the conductor the field from this charge and the field from this charge are going to be such that there is they cancel in this direction but they have a net field in this direction. So it looks like that the field is perpendicular to the surface of the conductor and that there is no component of field in the direction along the conductor. The question, thing is that there, it's not that there is no field, it's that there's no net field. Okay, the Coulomb field does not go away when charges enter into a conductor. The difference is when charges are in motion, though, okay, and the sense the charges are, 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 you know, in the conductor plate, and let's say the charges are moving to the left, well, you've got this component, which is a field going in the direction of motion, and it's increasing into the imaginary plane. This is a field that's going in the opposite direction, but since it's being pulled away, it's negative. And so you end up with a net displacement current into this field. Even though the net field is zero, the displacement current becomes non-zero when the charges move. So you can't get rid of the displacement current just because you say it's in a conductor and that there's no net field, because a net field can be zero when the displacement current is non-zero. Argument number two. Uh, we are told that the displacement current given by this equation here and the conduction current given by this equation. And because there's no published value for the relative permittivity of good conductor, and because the displacement current inside of a conductor is re really no value to engineering and thus not discussed, people assume that the relative permittivity inside a conductor is zero. And if the relative permittivity inside a good conductor is zero, then you would assume that the displacement current would also have to be zero. Okay, but let's look at this in a little more detail because if the very powerful Coulomb, remember in the previous slides, we showed that the very powerful Coulomb forces drive the charges to cancel the net field in the conductor. Therefore, the permittivity of a good conductor cannot be zero. Because if the permittivity of a good conductor is zero and I added extra charge to that conductive block, they wouldn't spread out because they're not, they're not Coulombly interacting with each other. Because if the permittivity is zero, then there's no conduction of the electric field for these guys to be able to spread themselves out so they could cancel the net electric field. Okay, so the permittivity of good conductor cannot be zero. So the question is, what is the permittivity of a good conductor? Well, we have to understand where all this stuff came from. Most of this came from the study of capacitors. Here's a capacitive equation. Capacitor is two conductive plates separated by a gap. We're going to show it in profile as these are the plates looking end on and D is the distance between the plates and A is the area of the plates. And the capacitance is given by the permittivity of the dielectric times the area of the plates divided by the distance between the plates. And granted, this is a good approximation. Okay, but let's talk about capacitors and let's derive a theory of what should be the capacitance of a good conductor if, if this is all related. Okay, DC cannot pass through a normal capacitor. And we're not talking about leakage, we're talking about an ideal capacitor. Okay, to pass lower and lower frequencies to a capacitor requires higher and higher capacitance. And therefore, to pass a DC capacitor, uh, to pass DC through a capacitor would require a theoretical capacitor of infinite capacitance. Keep that in mind and you'll see where we're going. So let's look at an air core capacitor first. Okay, the capacitance is given by mu naught because there's no relative per the relative permittivity of air is one, so it's, it's the epsilon naught times the area over the distance. Fine. What, do we, what happens when we put a dielectric in there? Well, a dielectric of relative permittivity two will effectively double our capacitance over the previous example. In other words, if I took this example from this guy and just added a non-air core to it, that would double our capacitance if the relative permittivity is 2. But now that's identical 
it's identical as if I just shortened the plates by half the distance. That has the exact same effect. It could be modeled either way. Why did they chose to do it this way as opposed to using something like relative distance as opposed to relative permittivity? Well, and the reason why they did it that way is because back then they, they thought current was a continuous fluid. They had no knowledge of electrons and protons. Okay, had they had the knowledge, they probably would have uh, modeled it differently because when you add a dielectric, which is basically just two charges in some sort of lever arm that are mechanically held, that's effectively shortening the distance. These guys act as surrogates for shorting the distance. So shorting, using a relative distance model is equally as good. But let's continue now. Let's continue with our discussion of what the permittivity of a good conductor is. Let's assume we fill up half of the distance between our conductive plates with a piece of copper. Well, that's the same as bringing the distance of these plates to half, which would give us, which is better modeled this way than this way, but you could use the effect, the relative permittivity of two in this case. Great, no problem. So what if we bring copper all the way? Well, if we brought copper all the way, that'd be the same as shorting the plates. And that would give us the effective permittivity, or the, sorry, the relative permittivity of infinity, which would give us a capacitance of infinity, which fits with the discussion we had before of what kind of capacitor would transmit um, a current, which wouldn't block DC. But here's the rub. Now that we have a relative permittivity of infinity and we put it back into our equation, we get infinite displacement current. So now we've solved the, we have solved the energy crisis. We now have a means of infinite energy. All we need to do is build a capacitor with a copper um, dielectric. Okay, and so this is ridiculous. Okay, this is why we should use relative distance rather than relative permittivity for dielectrics. And you've got to remember the number of flux lines passing through the dielectric does not depend on the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the number of flux lines passing through any given dielectric depend on the charges on the plates, not the dielectric. The dielectric does not enhance the Coulomb field that goes through it. All it does is make the Coulomb field pass more easily with less resistance, as if you were shorting the plates. Okay, because otherwise, if the dielectric magnified the number of flux lines, you'd get to an overunity problem. Because where do all these extra flux lines come out of nowhere? I mean, do they come out of nowhere? No. Okay, you can't have flux lines without charge, and that's why shortening, shorting the plates is a better, uh, sh reducing the distance between the plates is a better model for. Uh, dielectrics than the ER model that they came up with hundreds of years ago. And what we learned from this, which is what was echoed in video 8, that the mathematical models that we use for science and engineering only represent man's feeble attempts to mimic nature. Monkey see, monkey mimic. Nothing that we know was handed to us by God on stone tablets. My God, if it were, we wouldn't follow them anyway. And the only thing irrefutable is human stupidity. Both physicists and clerics believe they have irrefutable knowledge of the universe. Okay, us engineers, we only want models that mimic nature reliably. We got too many cool things to build. Okay, so how can we use what we just learned to identify bad or wrong models? We're going to be getting into new rules of acquisition here. If you look at the movie The Race for the Double Helix, uh, which is a Jeff Goldblum movie in 1987, I can tell you the whole movie in four lines. 90% of the movie they were stymied because the parts didn't fit together and they're trying to figure out how all the oxygen molecules giving up the electron, da 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 da. And then someone from another department looks over their shoulder and says, oh, you got the wrong model for one of the base pairs. Yeah, we just figured out it's this model, and they wrote it down. And then the next scene, you see Jeff Goldblum cutting out little pieces of paper, and they fit together like child's puzzle pieces. And the next shot, they had the complete model of DNA right there, right in front of them. The rest, last 10% of the movie, they're gloating and showing it off to everybody. And it's okay if you get the right models of nature. It, sh it should be fun and easy, and you should be able to gloat, like you're winning a basketball game or whatever. But it shows that when you get the right models, science should be child's play. Another example, Einstein spent the remainder of his life trying to unify the forces of nature. And he failed because he had the wrong models. Okay, it's basically a brilliant man with wrong models is effectively uh, no better than a monkey. If he had the right models, it would have been child's play. So we have rule of acquisition number 23, the stagnation tell. Okay, basically, if, mo if science is being held up, then we must have a wrong model somewhere because science should be child's play. Okay, 
Now, we have to remember what our models are, and we call them laws. That's very disingenuous when scientists call their stuff laws, because it gives a false impression to people that we actually know what the heck we're doing. Okay, basically all we do, and, and this is echoing of video number eight again, is we measure a phenomenon, monkey see. Then we mimic the data, monkey do, to make it usable. We either put that into a lookup table and, with interpolation, or we find a mathematical function that fits the data. But what does that do? That results in a constant of relation. Always. So the constant relation is the marker of an empirical model. All of these are models that are curve fit to empirical data, except for this guy. Excuse me, that's a good sign. So these are not laws, they're not irrefutable truths, they're simple mimics that have a limited range of usability like any empirical model. For example, in, in Coulomb's law here, when the distance goes to zero, the force goes to infinity? No, that shows that there's a limitation in this model. Well, I've already shown you the limitation in this model. And I'm sure there's a limitation in this model because here's a cons big old fat stinking constant of relation. Okay, they're all incomplete. If you go back to video eight, I'll show you how models are incomplete. So here's Distinti's constant relation caveat. Constant relation is the marker of an empirical model, monkey see, monkey do. Unification only occurs when a constant relation is eliminated. It is my belief that a true theory of everything should contain no more than one constant relation. I gave myself out and out here. Okay, and be, be careful. A constant relation is an indirect constant, meaning that they are not measured directly. Okay, this caveat does not apply to direct constants like speed of light, nor does it apply to unitless constants like constants of conversion or scaling. In ethereal mechanics, we'll at least be eliminating G. I believe I can eliminate the electric field constant. I'm not quite there yet, but I will be there before the video is made. So recap, if energy is destroyed, then reciprocally it can be created. If at this point you still believe that Maxwell's equations, relativity, quantum mechanics, and others represent irrefutable truths or laws, then show me the damn stone tablets. And if they contain one constant of relation, they are fakes. Because Mother Nature is perfect, only retarded monkeys need constants of relation. Uh, so what's next? We're, the next video we're continuing with Distinti's universe. We're going to talk about the sun. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, 28 planetary orbits and precession. Then we go to black holes and galaxies. And then uh, we may, I may combine these together because I'm getting bored of this stuff. So I, I want to go back on into the, 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 the uh, electromagnetic physics part. Uh, so yeah, there's, video for, uh, there's homework for video number 27. I want you to look for what, uh, there's a Secrets of the Sun, a BBC thing. If you go to YouTube and search for Secrets of the Sun, you'll find the link. Um, and I want you to look for what are sunspots, why are they dark, why aren't they light, you know, you know they said they, well anyway, we're going to discuss all this in the video, but just go watch the video and, and just look at these things and write them down, what, what they say, so you can compare them to what we got. Uh, thank you. You can see I'm doing this with natural sunlight because here's the shadow encroaching upon the video. <laughs> um, uh, thank you in advance for those who are contributing. I, I appreciate that. Uh, it's helping me with, with basic supplies and stuff. And But please, give me likes. Give me a like. Uh, and please sh uh, share these videos with other people. Let them know what's going on. I don't have time to get on and do all this stuff. I am in a race to the finish, if, as it were. So I'm trying to get these videos out as quickly as I possibly can. Thank you. Bye.